Okay, so this is the second set of notes dealing with collecting data. This is specifically about experiments. All right, so not every procedure that collects data is an experiment. Um, if there is nothing that is done that actually influences the response, what you're dealing with there is what's called a, an observational study which is different from an experiment because you're not actually trying to influence the result. You're just observing something. So be careful. Not every the procedure is an experiment. Some are observational studies. Um, in an experiment, or an observational study for that matter, we've said before that you have two variables. You have a response variable, which is the one that you're measuring to see like, if you do the study or you do an experiment, what's happening. Uh, and you have an explanatory variable, which is something that you believe will either help explain or predict the change in the response variable. Now, we saw this in the last unit because we had the R squared thing that told us that the change in the response variable, the percentage of the change in this response variable, that can be accounted, by, accounted for by a change in the explanatory variable, given a model, is R squared. Okay. Confounding is like if you have two explanatory variables, right? So you have two variables that are equally impacting the response variable. So you don't know like whether which one of them is actually the one that's changing the response variable. Okay, so that's an example of confounding. Okay, uh, it could be two or more actually. So when we do an experiment we actually um, impose some sort of treatment on the experimental units, on the, th the things that are being measured, right? So we deliberately do something to them, and then we watch the result, right? Uh, sometimes it's helpful to have something that's called a placebo, which is basically exactly the same as the treatment, except for there's nothing that's active about it, right? So it does everything that the treatment does, except for the one thing that you're measuring. And that helps us to try to deal with some of these confounding issues. Um, you hear me talking about a treatment. This is a, a specific thing that you do to the, um, sorry, treatment is a specific thing that you do to uh, an experimental unit so that you can watch the result, right? Uh, it can be a combination of different things, but that's the treatment that's being applied. The experimental unit is um, an object to which the treatment is assigned, right? So either you're, they're getting the treatment or they're not getting the treatment. That's what the experimental unit is. And if those experimental units happen to be human, we call them subjects okay? instead of units because I wouldn't want to be called a unit. So then I'm the subject of the experiment. Um, a factor is a specific thing that's being manipulated. Okay, so like if you are, um, you know, if you're looking at your treatment, a, a, a certain variable that's being manipulated is the factor, and the different values that you change that factor to are what are called levels, right? So like we might be doing a, a drug trial, right, and we might like be introducing a drug into people's systems, and we might do it at 5, 10, or 15 milligrams to see what's going on there. All right, so that's factors and levels. Um, oftentimes in an experiment, we have a control group, which is like our baseline group. Now note, the control group could be a group that gets like a placebo. It could have an active treatment, like the baseline could be getting five milligrams, and then we'll see what happens at 10 and 15, or it could be a group that's getting no treatment at all. So this is the group that we use as a baseline. Uh, we talked about placebos before. Sometimes when you introduce a placebo, people just automatically have a response, oftentimes favorably, if you just introduce a treatment at all. So it's like, ooh, somebody's doing something to me. I must be feeling better. That's what we call um, a placebo effect, even if there's not an active treatment being imposed. A good structure for an experiment is double blind which means that both the subjects, the people who are being treated, and the person who is doing the measuring of the response variable have no idea who is actually getting the, 
which factors of the treatment. So that's a good situation because neither one can impact the result. Single blind is a little bit not as strong, but it can be effective. Single blind is either the subjects don't know what factor they're being given or the person who is watching the response variable doesn't know. So it could be either way. You could either be blinding the subject or blinding the measurer. Uh, these are things that you want in an experiment. You want to have random assignment. So you want to take your group of subjects and you want to randomly assign some of them to get each of the different levels of the factor. Um, so when we talk about getting treatments, they should be chosen in a random way. Sometimes we want to be certain that we're exercising control and making sure that that factor is what we're measuring. So you can't turn all the knobs and get an accurate measure. So you want to control as many variables as you possibly can and see what that specific factor is going to go and do to the response variable. Replication. In a good experiment, you don't want to just give that factor to one person or that treatment to one person. You want to give it to multiple. So you want to make sure that it's actually the treatment that's causing the change in the response variable rather than just some chance aspect of the, like, the random assignment. Okay? So the way we kind of knock out that, ooh, it just happened by chance, is that we do replication. Multiple people under multiple factors. Uh, so there's different ways that you can achieve randomization. One is you can just take the whole group and say, all right, we're just going to split you up randomly, and we're going to make that happen. That's what we call a completely randomized design. Uh, you can do a blocks of groups. So you could take, like, let's say, blocks by age, like littles, adolescents, uh, young adults, uh, what do you call it, um, midlife, aged, right? And then you could see, like, does, and then within those blocks, you randomize, right? So does this treatment have a different effect by, like, different age groups or maybe different racial groups or different genders, that kind of thing. Uh, so that's how we build blocks, and then we randomize within the block, and we get what we call a randomized block design. Last one is usually considered one of the, the better ways to design an experiment, if you can do it, is matched pair. And there's like, you know, you like grab your population that you're testing, and you try to find two people that are like closely with each other, and you make them a block. And then another two people that are closely again, and then you randomly choose one of those two to get the treatment, and the other one not to. The ideal matched pair design would be like doing this with identical twins all the way down the line. Very expensive, hard to do. Um, another way to get matched pair is actually to take the same person and, like, week one, give them the treatment or not. Week two, give them the treatment or not and see what's different. And then randomize whether or not they get the treatment in week one or week two. That's still a matched pair design. Even though it's the same person, they're being treated in both places. All right. So experiments are procedures where treatment is applied to an experimental unit, if they're humans, we call them subjects, in order to measure the relationship between an explanatory variable and a response variable. And all of this is about how to do that in a productive and useful way. So for the next several classes, this is what we're going to be looking at. All right? All right, so thank you, and uh, we'll see you in class.